Welcome to the First Unitarian Society of Milwaukee's online worship service. I'm Reverend Dina McFeeters, and I'm honored to serve as associate minister. We welcome people of all genders, sexualities, ages, races, ethnicities, histories, and bodies. We welcome your mind, your heart, and your spirit. We welcome all that you are carrying with you today and all that your heart longs to set down. We'd like to pay a special welcome to guests joining us today. If you're visiting for the first time or joining us from afar, why don't you say hello in the chat and tell us where you're joining us from. A reminder that next week, Sunday, October 3rd, our worship service will be both online and outdoors in person at Kaddish Park in Milwaukee at 10 a.m. Please see our website for more information, including COVID precautions. Finally, I welcome you to our worship service by inviting you to repeat our mission after me. We gather to nurture the spirit, engage the mind, and inspire action. Hmm. These opening words are called Space for New Possibility by Reverend Gretchen Haley. What's going to happen? Will everything be okay? What can I do? In these days, we find ourselves too often stuck with these questions on repeat. What's going to happen? Will everything be okay? What can I do? We grasp at signs and markers, articles of news and analysis, Facebook memes and forwarded emails as if the new zodiac capable of forecasting all that life may yet bring our way, as if we could prepare, as if life had ever made any promises of making sense or turning out the way we thought, as if we are not also actors in this still unfolding story. For this hour, we gather to surrender to mystery, to release ourselves from the needing to know, the yearning to have it all already figured out, and also the burden of believing we either have all the control or none. Here in our song and our silence, our stories and our sharing, we make a space for new breath, a new healing, a new possibility to take root that is courage forged in the fire of our coming together and felt in the spirit that comes alive in this act of faith, that we believe still a new world is possible, that we are creating it already here and now. Come, let us worship together. Let's return to our beloved sanctuary for the lighting of the flaming chalice, symbol of Unitarian Universalism. Good morning. My name is Paul Kozadowski, and I'm pleased to be your worship associate today. I played piano since I was seven years old, but I don't think I understood the power of playing a musical instrument until I was in college. I had ended my lessons and my attempts to play classical piano and started to dabble around with jazz and improvisation. And I discovered Keith Jarrett. I probably wore out the grooves of a double album called The Colne Concert 
which presented a little over an hour of Jarrett playing extended, completely improvised solos. If you know any of that recording or any of Jarrett's many solo recordings, you understand the power and beauty of his playing. And you know that one of Jarrett's trademarks is his very audible moaning as he digs into a rhythmic pattern. It's the sound of being completely consumed by making music, pure surrender. That feeling of surrender happens to me sometimes when I play, but more often when I hear a brilliant musician play and it has become something I crave and pursue at every opportunity. I'm not alone, of course. People have their own ways of pursuing surrender as part of a cheering crowd at a football game, pushing themselves in a long distance run, or finding their center in silent meditation. The poem, God and the Artist's Colony by Rebecca Baggett offers an unlikely connection between two kinds of people pursuing surrender. As I share the poem, perhaps you can imagine yourself as part of an artist's colony, gathering with others who are fresh from an intense day of inviting their own kind of surrender. God and the Artist's Colony by Rebecca Baggett. Talking at dinner, we discover how many of us have fundamentalist families, mothers and sisters stricken with gifts of tongues, ponderous deacon fathers, brothers who praise Jesus for every red light missed. God rides them, we decide, the way our art rides us. Perhaps God is their art driving them toward that perfect abnegation, that desire to open themselves and let him fill them, use them, just as we, alone here, locked in our separate cells, struggle to surrender self and let our blankness fill with words, light, music, images flashing against the dark screen of our eyes, each of us moving, aching toward that private, Alleluia. Revelation. Yes. But life's not a highway and there is no map And things if you want don't just fall in your lap And right when you think that you've figured out what's going on You turn and you learn what you thought was suddenly gone I grew up here just an average kid Dreaming of all of the places I'd go I was too busy to bother with boys And when one asked me out, I would always say no But when I saw calm, don't ask me, I couldn't say Life's 
not a highway and there is no guide And most of the time you're just there for the ride The deep inside I know my journey has only begun So as long as there's gas in the tank You keep doing what For those of us born after 1939, the movie The Wizard of Oz was undoubtedly part of our childhood and adolescence. I remember watching it on TV when I was quite young and cowering under the sofa when the flying monkeys were chasing Dorothy and her friends. The Wicked Witch of the West's sky writing Surrender, Dorothy, struck terror into my young heart. And I cheered when Dorothy and her friends used every resource they had to resist surrender. There are many reasons to resist surrender. Surrender connotes giving up the fight, showing weakness, admitting defeat, being submissive, losing control, and letting pain, suffering, and injustice have the upper hand. Unitarian Universalists typically don't like to surrender. There are no topic headings for surrender in our UU hymnals. We are people who fight the good fight, who are self-reliant, who have faith that reason and human effort will prevail against evil. And I love that about us. Personally, growing up Unitarian Universalist, I always chafed at the concept in other religions that surrender was a requirement of faith of living a spiritual life. I didn't want to be a puppet with God pulling the strings. And yet, I am coming to realize that there is something in the experience of surrender that opens up possibilities which we cannot know otherwise. During the worship associate retreat, when we reflected on September's theme of embracing possibility, a clump of ideas emerged about surrender. People said, we have to let go of what is no longer real in order to embrace possibilities for the future. They said answers won't come unless we admit that we might be wrong about anything and release our control mindset. They said, until we surrender perfectionism, we won't become aware of the full breadth and depth of possibilities. If the pandemic has taught me anything, it has taught me that Perfectionism is pretty useless. Showing up and doing my best in the moment, however far that is from my usual standards, is really all I can expect of myself and others. Yet, my allegiance to perfectionism is dying a long, slow death. It is such a pattern for me. In her book, Kitchen Table Wisdom, Stories That Heal, by Dr. Rachel Naomi Remen, the chapter called Beyond Perfection 
is instructive. Remen writes, wholeness lies beyond perfection. Perfection is only an idea. For most experts and many of the rest of us, it has become a life goal. The pursuit of perfection may actually be dangerous to your health. The type A personality for whom perfectionism is a way of life is associated with heart disease. Perfectionism can break your heart and all the hearts around you. The pursuit of perfection has become a major addiction of our time, she continues. The pursuit of perfection is built into every professional training. But long before I went to medical school, I was trained as a perfectionist by my father. As a child, when I brought home a 98 on an exam, he invariably responded, what happened to the other two points? I adored my dad and my whole childhood was focused on the pursuit of the other two points. By the time I was in my 20s, I had become as much a perfectionist as he. It was no longer necessary for him to ask me about those two points. I had taken that over for myself. It was many years before I found out that those points don't matter, that they are not the secret to living a life worth remembering, that they don't make you lovable or whole. Life offers us many teachers and many teachings, she continues. One of mine was David, who was an artist and my first love. While we were together, my driver's license came up for renewal and I needed to take a written test of the traffic laws. The DMV had sent a little booklet and I studied it for days. All the while I was memorizing the meaning of the white curb and the yellow curb, David would try to persuade me to join him for a walk or go to a party or out to dinner or dancing or even just talk. I told him I couldn't take the time. Of course, I got 100% on the test. Triumphant, I rushed into his studio shouting that I had gotten 100% on my driving test. David looked up from his painting with an expression of great tenderness. My love, he said, why would you want to do that? It was not the response I had expected. Suddenly I understood that I had sacrificed a great deal to get a hundred on a test that I had only needed to pass in order to drive. I had spent days studying for it that I could have spent in much wiser ways. I had learned many things that I did not even want to know. It had felt as if I had no choice. If my father could not approve of me with anything less than 100, I could not approve of myself with less than 100 either, even on a written driving test. It was clearly not about driving. It was not even about grades. It was about needing to deserve love. Fortunately, David did not play by these rules. He didn't even know the game. Do any of you recognize yourself in Remen's story? I do. Coincidentally, I remember studying obsessively for the written driver's test in high school. I was triumphant when I received 100 on that test too. But guess what? 
I failed my behind the wheel exam. All that book learning and accomplishment didn't necessarily apply to real life skills. It was years before I fully recognized how perfectionism had me in its grip. I had thought it was just a commitment to excellence, but perfectionism was affecting my life, my self-esteem, my ability to learn and apply what I learned in the real world. One way this manifested was in my addiction to getting good grades in school. The thing that jumps out at me in Remen's story about the way she studied for the written driver's test is her statement, it felt as if I had no choice. Perfectionism can be so ingrained, we think there is no other choice, but there is. When I entered seminary in my 30s, I was determined to engage a different attitude toward learning. My seminary offered an option to select pass-fail instead of letter grades. I chose the pass-fail system, which freed me from a great deal of anxiety, false striving, and shame. I could surrender to the joy of learning what I needed to know to become a minister in the real world. I worked hard and excelled in seminary, but the most important thing I practiced there was believing that I was worthy of learning and love, no matter the outcome of school. Raman writes, perfectionism is learned. No one is born a perfectionist, which is why it is possible to recover. Children can learn early that they are loved for what they do and not simply for who they are. To a perfectionistic parent, what you do never seems as good as what you might do if you tried just a little harder. The life of such children can become a constant striving to earn love. Of course, love is never earned. It is a grace we give each other. Anything we need to earn is only approval. Hmm. Remen's conclusions dovetail with what shame researcher Brene Brown writes in her book, The Gifts of Imperfection. Brown writes, perfectionism is not self-improvement. Perfectionism, perfectionism is at its core about trying to earn approval and acceptance. Healthy striving is self-focused. How can I improve? Perfectionism is other focused. What will they think? She continues, perfectionism is not the same thing as striving to be your best. Perfectionism is not about healthy achievement and growth. Perfectionism is the belief that if we live perfect, look perfect, and act perfect, we can minimize or avoid the pain of blame, judgment, and shame. It's a shield. Perfectionism is a 20-ton shield that we lug around thinking it will protect us, when in fact, it's the thing that's really preventing us from taking flight. Hmm. Why am I talking about perfectionism this morning? Because until we surrender perfectionism, we cannot find and embrace the breadth and depth of creative possibilities that surround us and that are within us possibilities that may be life-saving and lead us into the new world that we so desperately need. And I know it's hard to change our patterns. It's hard for Unitarian Universalists to reconsider the concept of surrender. 
so let me pose a few questions that might help us enter and perhaps redeem this concept. When and how have you had a good experience of surrender? Was it during a creative process such as making art, music, dance, or writing? Did it happen within a romantic relationship? Was it while giving birth? Was it watching, witnessing a loved one die a peaceful death? How might you experiment with surrender as a spiritual practice? Frank Ostaseski, co-founder of the Zen Hospice Project writes, surrender is not the same thing as letting go. Normally we think of letting go as a release, often accompanied by a sense of freedom from previous restraints. Surrender is more about expansion. There is a freedom in surrender, but it is not really about setting something down or distancing ourselves from an object, person, or experience. With surrender, he writes, we are free because we have expanded into a spaciousness a boundless quality of being that can include, but not be constrained by the previously limiting beliefs that once defined us, keeping us separate and apart. In surrender, we are reconstituted. We are reconstituted. We become intimate with the inner truth of our essential nature. In surrender, we feel ourselves not gaining distance, but rather coming closer. Hmm. Friends, I have become aware that in my ministry and my personal life, surrender as a spiritual practice is the only way for me to survive this pandemic with any sense of wholeness and hope. And the practice is not easy, it, it's a paradox. I feel so distant from our first church community, yet those of you who I am blessed to interact with on Zoom over these last 18 months, I feel much closer to you. I feel a greater sense of intimacy as we share our vulnerabilities, our fears, our hopes, our challenges, our efforts to help those who are suffering and, and to find meaning and purpose in new ways. Although I rarely see them, I also feel closer to our staff team as together we admit what we have no control over and what we can choose. As exhaustion forces us to change our standards from perfect to good enough. As we struggle with the fact that we can't do it all. And we trust that doing the most important things will serve this congregation well. And as we practice grace with each other, even when we don't feel like it. Hmm. I know it's hard to feel this vulnerable so much of the time. It's hard to admit our lack of control over so many things. And yet, I know that when I surrender my control mindset, so many more possibilities appear and I don't have to come up with all of them. I have faith that there is something growing in the spaciousness 
of surrender. I'm going to leave you with a quote from Catholic priest, professor, and writer Henri Nguyen called Fruits That Grow in Vulnerability. He wrote, there is a great difference between successfulness and fruitfulness. Success comes from strength, control, and respectability. A successful person has the energy to create something, to keep control over its development, and to make it available in large quantities. Success brings many rewards and often fame. Fruits, however, come from weakness and vulnerability. And fruits are unique. A child is the fruit conceived in vulnerability. Community is the fruit born through shared brokenness. And intimacy is the fruit that grows through touching one another's wounds. Let's remind one another that what brings us true joy is not successfulness, but fruitfulness. Hmm. Well, I hope this journey through different ideas about surrender has opened you up to the possibilities of its spaciousness and that it can be a positive thing. Let's turn to musician Leah, who shares a song she describes as an upbeat song of surrender. These closing words are a short poem called Enough by David White. Enough. These few words are enough. If not these words, this breath. If not this breath, this sitting here this opening to the life we have refused again and again until now, until now. Dear ones, may you surrender and open to the life that is waiting for you. May it be so, and amen. We are going, heaven knows where we are going, we know within, and we will get there, heaven knows how we will get there, but we know we will, oh yeah, yeah. Wo ya ya, wo ya ya, wo ya ya, wo ya.